Hey, um, good to see you tonight. We're excited about jumping into Revelation. Uh, it is, it's here, so we're going to jump in. I did a bunch of uh, just reading and studying. I actually went ahead, like I've done in the past, I've uh, printed out John MacArthur's um, outline, uh, just the kind of the intro to the, to the Bible, which is in the, in the study Bible. It's on blueletterbible.com. If you ever remember, I've told you that many times, blueletterbible.com is a great resource. If you ever want to uh, study and see some of the original uh, Greek and Hebrew and look at commentaries, it's all free, which is a great thing. And I told you that I'm still bitter about it because it basically is completely everything that we paid for in Bible college, but it's on that app for free. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, whatever. Uh, it was worth it, though. It was worth it. Our Bible college uh, stuff was worth it. So we are uh, excited to uh, jump in tonight. And we have some... Uh, here you go, guys. I just got here. We've got some outlines here that I printed out. So you guys can have those. They're uh, on both sides. And... Uh, good stuff. Yes, they are good. <laughs> If, here, I'm going to leave these here. Would you do me a favor? There are two, there's two pages. If anybody else comes in, would you mind passing them out? Cool, cool. Well, um, think about any uh, prayer requests, anything like that. Um, we do have men's breakfast on Saturday morning if anyone's interested. Janine, there's an outline up here for you, if you don't mind grabbing that. Um, men's breakfast. Whoop. men's breakfast, and then uh, we do have on Sunday, if you don't know, anybody can come to this, but um, it's, it is for members as well. Uh, it's, it's, it is our annual meeting. You're allowed to come, but there will be like some votes and stuff, and only members are allowed to vote. But uh, just to see what's going on in our church and some of the stuff, you know, we'll be passing the, the budget and all that stuff. So a lot of fun, fun stuff through that. Um, Try to think of anything else happening. I don't think there's anything really major. Uh, to give you guys uh, a little bit of an idea of schedule-wise, I think I shared this already, but I'm going to share it every time when we're working out. We will be taking the month of July off, okay? Uh, it's it's uh, our, our kids' camp and everything, and, and life is pretty insane in July, so I will be taking off uh, from Bible study uh, the month of July. And um, we will be going through the uh, the twenty second. Will be our no no no, sorry the nineteenth of June. I'm looking at I was looking at the wrong month. The nineteenth of June will be our last Bible study, and then the twenty sixth will be prayer, and then we'll be off, and we'll we'll start up again in August. So we'll get a couple weeks into uh, Revelation, which we probably won't make it very far in those few weeks, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that does it. Is there anybody else that has any prayer requests or anything going on? All right, well, let's go ahead and pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for uh, tonight and just for the opportunity for all of us to gather and to jump into your word. We thank you for uh, the fact that it is your word. We thank you that we can trust it and Lord, that you will guide us. Uh, tonight into just a little bit more of understanding. Lord, um, Revelation is an amazing book, and it literally tells us that we will be blessed if we read it, if we, if we take it in and we do what it says. So Lord, I pray that you'll guide us and, and teach us and help us understand what it means to walk in the words of Revelation, Lord, in the words of your love and purpose. And uh, we just pray for all that you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So good. Well, I have uh, been doing quite a bit of study on Revelation, and uh, you know, it was interesting. Uh, I just kind of, I just started, just, I just read through it. It's been a long time since so I just, from, from the very first chapter through, and I read all the way through it, and, and it really, man, I don't, what, a, what an awesome book. I don't know why people are, are afraid of it. Um, I, I can get it. I mean, there's things that you don't completely understand, and you don't completely grasp, but it's beautiful. I mean, it's just amazing how... Uh, what God is going to do for us and how his redemption is so clear in it. And that part is amazing. So um, I wanted to just jump in a little bit. One of the things that um, 
I'm not going to go through all of the introduction uh, that John MacArthur has in the study Bible, but I'm going to go. I'm going to talk about the interpretive challenges because there is there's four pretty common. There's sometimes there's more than a, a certain way of interpreting, but there is four main ways that people interpret Revelation, and we're going to look through these. So go to the section on that paper. It's the interpretive challenge. It's it's uh, close to it's right before the outline of that last page. Um, you'll see it. In fact, I think it says interpretive uh, challenge all the way to the bottom of one page, and then it starts it on the next page, just the way it printed out. So um, I don't have great uh, administrative skills. So I just uh, copy and paste it. Loren, don't laugh at me about that. It's not that funny. Anyways, um, so you copy and paste, and whatever happens, happens. So uh, without help from people like Loren or, or uh, Kendra, uh, it always prints out weird. So anyways... So, here we go. So, interpretive challenges. No other New Testament book poses more serious and difficult interpretive challenges than Revelation. The book's vivid imagery and striking symbolism have produced four main interpretive approaches. The preterist approach interprets Revelation as a description of the first century events in Roman Empire. This view conflicts with the book's own often repeated claim to be prophecy. And you can see that it has the different, like, chapter 1, verse 3, 22, 7, 10, 18, and 19, those chapters. It is impossible to see all the events in Revelation as already fulfilled. The second coming of Christ, for example, obviously did not take place in the first century. The histor historist's uh, approach views Revelation as a panoramic view of church history from apostolic times to the present. Seeing in the symbolism such events as the barbarian invasions of Rome, the rise of the Roman Catholic Church, as well as various individual popes, the emergence of Islam and the French Revolution. This interpretive method robs Reve Revelation of any meaning for those to whom it was written. It also ignores the time limitations the book itself places on the unfolding events. Historicism uh, has produced many different and often conflicting interpretations of the actual historical events contained in Revelation. The idealist approach interprets Revelation as a timeless depiction of the co cosmic struggle between forces of good and evil. In this view, the book contains neither historical illusions nor predictive prophecy. This view also ignores Revelation's uh, prophetic character, and if carried to its logical conclusion, severs the book from any connection with actual historical events. Revelation then becomes merely a collection of stories designed to teach spiritual truth. The futurist approach insists that the events of chapters 6 through 22 are yet future, and that those chapters literally and symbolically depict actual people and events yet to appear on the world scene. It describes the events surrounding the second coming of Jesus Christ, the millennium and final judgment, and the eternal state. Only this view does justice to Revelation's claim to be prophecy and interprets the book by the same grammatical historic, historical method as chapter 1 through 3 and the rest of Scripture. So, again, just kind of giving you an idea of these four different views where people are coming at it. We come at it at the futuristic approach, okay? We, we believe that uh, one, one through three is a thing, like, chap, chapter, really chapter one from one to 20, and he gives you that outline. Remember what Chris, Chris brought up last week, and, and just open up really quick to chapter one, verse 19. It says this, Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. This is actually an outline of Revelation. The first chapter, as for the mysteries, or, or for the first chapter, says, therefore, write the things which you have seen. All right? And then it says, and the things which are. That's chapter 2 through 3. That's the, the church age. That's what's going on. He, he, he's writing letters to certain cities in the church, okay? And then the things which will take place after these things. And then uh, from four on is the future. It's what's going to happen end times. So just to kind of give you an idea. So really, out of all these interpretive 
ways, the last one is the only one that actually even lines up with Revelation itself of its understanding of interpretation. Okay? Does that make sense? So, um, the things which are, which, which we're talking, we'll go through the, the churches. We will not be able to go very fast through this. There's a lot in this, and, and I want to make sure you grasp what it's trying to say. Now, in my opinion, there are two ways of looking at the letters to the churches. The letters to the churches are actually to the cities that it's talking about, which is modern day in the area of modern day Turkey. It's giving us specific letters to those churches. It has good things, and it has bad things of what they're doing. I also think you can almost see uh, different denominations or different church eras in some of these things that we've, we've had different beliefs come and go in the church. We have different interpretations come and go in the church. And you can kind of see these in these letters of the churches. But the biggest thing we need to see is what God's calling us to and what we should be about as our church and the, the, the people of the church around us and what we need to be focusing on, okay? So that, that idea, all right? Anybody have anything to add to that before we just jump into chapter one? No. All right, well, let's jump in. I love it right off the bat. You know, one of the things that people always call this book is Revelations. It's not Revelations, it's Revelation. It's the, why do I say that? Well, because the very first part of it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not Revelations. Christ has given us, he's revealing to us, that word revelation, it means uh, the uh, apocalypse. It also means to uncover or to reveal. He's giving them an encouragement of the end times as they're being persecuted, they're being all these things. He's, he's, and we get into what, what John, why we know it's John, all right? Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated by his angel to his bondservant, John. Okay? So who do you think wrote this? The apostle John. John. Wrote it. Yeah, and you actually will see this. It's said quite a few times that John himself wrote it. There's uh, clear evidence of that. There, there's never been any um, church history that has really gone against that. Okay, now some people will say it wasn't John the Apostle. Some people might do that. But really, if you look at the context of it and the way he wrote it, and you look at his other letters, they kind of line up pretty almost direct. Okay, so... Yeah, his verbiage in there, yes. the way he expresses himself other yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yes. All right. Who testifies, look at it says, who testifies to the word of God. Now that's the key. He believes and knows this is what? The word of God. Okay. And to testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Now one of the things that you've got to make sure in the interpretation of any scripture, but especially Revelation, you cannot lose the fact that this is about Jesus Christ and his redemption and what he is. If you get away from that, your interpretations will go all over the place. It's about the redemptive desire and the redemptive purpose of Christ. Okay? That's, that's the key to it. All right? But let's go back a little bit. I want to show you, and we haven't gone very far, but God's the one that gave it to him, to his bond servants. Okay? That bond servant is those that have given up their freedom to Christ, have, 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 have given themselves to him. Many times Paul calls, him, Paul calls himself a bondservant, right? And what that is, and in, in, in if you've, I've talked about this, but if you ever go back to understand what a bondservant is, you had slaves, and after a while, especially if you were Jewish, after seven years, you actually were given freedom. Whatever that, a lot of times it was because of money that you were a slave, or a lot of time, and you would give, you'd get freedom. Well, if your master takes care of you really well, and does everything for you and loves you and treats you well and you do a job for them and they love you, you're being taken care of. Why would you want to leave that? Now you're going to have to go get a different job. You're going to have to go find your own money and this guy's taking care of me. So what you would do is you actually give up, voluntarily give up your freedom. You would actually go to the priest or, or to the, 
the government or whatever it was, a lot of times in the Jewish world it was the priest, and you would, you would symbolically give up your freedom. They would take you to the city post, and they would put your ear up to the city post, up to the gate, and they would actually put a hole in your ear, and they would put a, 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 a gold earring in it. And that was representation of you being a bondservant. You gave up your freedom to your master. That's what that word bondservant is. So he's there showing it to the ones that gave up their freedom to him. The things which must soon take place. That, what do you think that means? Soon take place. Events will be happening. Okay. Yep. What else? I mean, think about hearing that, and actually, if you look at, if you look at the this word, and it, it really does mean almost like, in a very quick manner, okay. So, did it happen soon for them? No. But when it begins. Exactly. When it begins, it's going to happen fast. That's the understanding. When this happens, it's going to happen quickly. And, and I think that's why you hear me and I, you hear a lot of pastors that are talking about prophecy. They talk about it with urgency. Why? It's coming. When it starts, it's coming. And you've got to be ready for it. And sometimes it can happen without us even really. So does that mean it could happen without you even knowing? Hopefully not. If you are in the word of God, I would say that the signs are pretty clear. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're not in the Word of God and you're not in the understanding of the Spirit of God, here's the crazy part. You will miss it. There's a very good chance. I think there's people out there that know a little bit about it and they're saying, well, you know, once I see these things happen, but there's also going to be, there's going to be, you know, great just deception that's going to happen. So this soon take place. And he sent and communicated and his angels to his bondservant, John. So... Who's the one that spoke this to John? Jesus. Okay, the angel. So we see this. His angels, it says, his angel to his bondservant. Is Jesus an angel? No. No, he's God. So now you are going to see where Jesus does speak in some of Revelation. But these are actually angels speaking to John. Um, they're talking to him. We're going to find out where John is, by the way, here very soon. But So the testify of the Word of God, that's the key. And, and I can't say this enough. We've got to be careful of making decisions in our lives, making decisions in our relationships, decisions in everything we do without the Word of God. Because then what's it based on? Feelings. Feelings. It's based on man's wisdom. It's based on, and so as we read through this, you're going to hear some of man's wisdom because we're trying to interpret it. But man, the best way to interpret it is just let Scripture itself speak for itself, right? That's the key to it. So the angels are speaking to him, uh, but it's the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads these. This is it, guys. This is, this is, this is why I'm reading this. This is why we should read it often. Number three, it's right here. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. He gives it again. That same understanding of the Greek is the time is near. Now, this was written, how long ago was this written? You can actually cheat and look at your notes. It tells us. How long ago was it written? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a long time, we'll say, thousands of years, right? It's probably really, because it was like 90, what was it, 90 AD? Um, it's almost 3,000 years ago. Yeah, 94 to 96 AD. You think about how long ago that is, that's, that's a pretty long time. So, But what he's saying is the time is near because really in Christ's time, in John's time, this stuff was in the process of happening. The end times. I mean, we see it, obviously, it's 2,000 years later, but we definitely see that God has been working in, this, in, in his great plan throughout the, whole, throughout the whole time. And we're getting close. Yes, Larry? I like that must shortly. It gives you confidence that 
it is going to come. Yep. I've heard people say he was an old man, he didn't know what he was doing. Right. There's a lot of that. Uh, some churches don't accept it as uh, a book, I guess. Yeah, there, there are some. They, they don't believe that. Uh, they believe John lost his mind. Of course, he was on the island of Patmos, and he's out there by himself, so he probably was losing his mind when he was reading that, writing this. There's a lot of that kind of speculation. Yeah. Um, kind of interesting. Okay, kind of interesting. Because if he was losing his mind, then how was he specific on so many prophecies and specific on so many things and like that lined up? with the Bible. So if he's losing his mind, he's remembering the Bible because you see it all the way through. You're like, well, okay. This guy was losing his mind. He was actually pretty good at losing his mind, I'll tell you that. Interesting. But that is a good point. Anything else before we move on there? So you're about to get blessed. Know this. Because we're going to do this together and it's fun. All right. So verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ and faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom priests to his, to his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right? So this, he tells who it's being written to very clearly, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, okay? And then he tells them, great, that's, that's, a, that's a common greeting of the time, grace to you and peace. Uh, it's all about from him, about who he is. What are the seven spirits who are uh, before the throne? What is that, the seven spirits? He then later clarifies they're angels. Yep. That, that, that number seven, uh, one of the things that you, you always got to look at is, you know, sometimes numbers are very important. In fact, throughout the scriptures, numbers are very important. And you got to look at a common theme of the numbers. What's the number seven? Completion. 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 So the spirits of completion, there's a couple of different uh, ways of looking at that. It could just mean the completion of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, that isn't because it says... Uh, from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. So that whole, that could be a reference to the Holy Spirit. Um, and I think that's a, a main thing, right? Because then it says the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the king of the earth. So these are all pointing to Christ, to God, to the Holy Spirit. What else in that? The, the next part of that, to him who what loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. This is the key. It's to the churches. So these churches are believers in Christ. These churches are know what Christ has done for them on the cross. They, that he died for them for their sins so that they can be set free and released from the punishment of their sin. So grasp that. This isn't non-believers, because some of the definitions that we get into and some of the letters are pretty harsh to some of these people. And you think, oh, I don't know if these guys are believers. Well, to be honest with you, they are or they were at one point. And, and God, God uh, G, that John is giving them a clear revelation that what God is going to do if they don't return. Because each time, it, not each time, because there's one time it doesn't, but each time it talks about how they've walked away from the truth. And yet there's a remnant in each one of the cities that stays in the truth. Okay? He's made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. Let's talk about that for a second. He's made us to be a kingdom and priests. What does that mean? Priests serve the Lord. Okay. So in that kingdom... God's kingdom, we're there to serve the Lord. Absolutely. Okay. What else? Well, he's the one that's done it, not us. Yep. Absolutely. It's his kingdom. We are his believers. We are part of his kingdom. He is the one that does it, but he's called us priests. 
What does that mean? Intercessors. Okay. Yep. Intercessors, the, the ones that bring the message of the gospel. He calls us another part, Paul calls us a royal priesthood, right? Peter calls us that as well. We are in the kingdom of God. We are a part. In fact, we are the temple of God is what it says. So God, the people of God are the priesthood. The people of God are the, it's, the building is just a building. People don't like when I say that, but it's true. Now, has God given us a beautiful building? Yes. Has he used amazing people to do some awesome stuff in this place? Yes. But it's just a building. If we worship the building, we miss the point. we got to worship the God who gave us the ability to have this building. And guess what? We are the church. We could be outside in that field having church, and we're the church. Right? It's not the building. It's the people. Right? It's that old, uh, you know, open the chair. Okay, forget it. Anyways, you know, and, and that's, the, that's the key to it. But we are a priesthood, and that is something that we must learn to live in. I would encourage you in that. In the Old Testament, there's a picture of the priest didn't have any belongings in the land. They had, they were given the service. Yes. And, and what they received was from their service to the Lord, which is a picture of where we are. But unfortunately, a lot of the priests of the Old Testament took it to their own, uh, oh. their own glory and actually used it for their own Eli and will. Sons, yeah, yes. completely. And the unfortunate thing is we do the same thing. But we got to realize that this earth is not our possession. The stuff of this earth is not our possession. And that's living in that priesthood. You, you, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome. But the high priest, the key is the Old Testament points to the high priest. The high priest is the one that does the sacrifices to God for the people, right? Especially the once a year, the, 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 the sacrifice of atonement, right? And Christ was the ultimate priest. You read in the Hebrews that he is the better priest. He is the high priest. And because of what he has done for us, our sins are gone. And that's what he's talking about in there. Because of that, we are priests ourselves. It also would have been very, because in the day, um, in Israel, he, uh, Jews, there was very much a clergy lady separation because that's how it always was. Yeah. Um, and Christ came on the scene and said, you know, through salvation, you now. That's right. Are, like that would have been a total game changer right um for anyone to hear it uh you know the statements like that were why the leaders hated him yes um yeah because now their power is gone is gone he warned against reinstituting the holy priesthood yes very clearly and 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 they kept trying to re and that's why they, the judaizers kept coming back and going yes jesus is great but you still got to follow the high priest. You still got to follow the Jewish ways. And Jesus is like and Paul and all you know. All these guys are like, no, you're the high, you're the priest because of Christ and what He has done. You're the priesthood as a body, and and that's the understanding of it. And we got to again. But that was very, it was very upsetting to the Jewish people because they didn't grasp that and they didn't want to grasp that, right? But we got to be careful of having an arrogance too about it. I see things some. Christians have er an arrogance about it, like, oh, I am, I am a priesthood, I am great, you know. <laughs> no, I'm not. Christ has made me worthy, he has given me, but we also have to live in what Christ has given us, and that's the freedom of, of righteousness and freedom of Christ. All right, then it keeps going, to him uh, be glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, God who is and who was and who was to come, the Almighty. What sticks out to you guys in that? Well, in Acts 1-8 or 1-9, when the angel said, what are you looking up for? He's going to come back the same way he left. Yeah. In the clouds. And 
And then uh, Zechariah, we see the... Yeah, the reference there? Yes. Yep. He's coming, I, you know, again, this is Old Testament that he's quoting, right? So we got Old Testament talking about him returning, talking about end times. He's making reference to it here. People say, you guys shouldn't talk about old end times so much. Well, Jesus talked about it. We see it in the scriptures. I'm pretty sure it's something we should be talking about. He's going to return. In fact, we should encourage each other about that because that is encouraging, right? It's essential. I have a question. What's that? <clears throat> when it says he's coming and uh, every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. Yep. How, how do the people who pierced him see him? Is it from where they are now that they're no longer alive? Well, that, the, the question is, uh, he says, not a reference to the, Ro the four Roman soldiers usually involved in the crucifixion, but the Jews who were actually responsible for Christ's death. So it's like the Jewish people are going to know. Because they know, like Jewish people, even if they're not believers, they know what they did to Christ. They know the, the history of it. And they're going to be. Re it's going to be revealed to them. They're. It's. They're going to see it. So they're descendants. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I. I mean, will the actual people? Yeah. There might be a. There might be a. I mean, they're. They're going to know. I mean, I. I think once, in my opinion, when you're as much as when you're in heaven, you understand what God is and you realize and you're before God. I think once you're in hell, you realize the ramifications of what you what your life is given you. Right, an eternity away from God. You're gonna. I think there's gonna be a reality, um, and I think that's gonna be the pain of it, uh, according to what you see about about the punishment of hell. So, could be reference to that. It's pretty interesting, though. I didn't realize, I didn't remember that Daniel said the same thing in Daniel um, seven thirteen. Yep. It's Old and New Testament. It's all over the place. So he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That Alpha and Omega, what is that? Beginning and the end. It's beginning and end. He is, he is what he said he is all the way through. And, and, and there's a reference to even a way of like who was, who is, who was and who is to come, it's because he was here, he died, right? But he is alive. He's, no, he's, he's here, obviously, in the power of God and the spirit of God. He's not here physically, but he will return one day. Again, constant reinforcement to the return of Christ. And, and guys, that's an exciting thing. We can, we can definitely hang our hats on that point, <laughs> that Jesus will return. Now, can we tell you when? Can I tell you the day? Can I tell you the hour? Can I tell you exactly how? I, I can't. But we're going to start looking through and you're going to see some of these things. All right, so then he kind of gives you an idea of where he was. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and, and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, um, you can, if you want to look up like the history of the disciples, you can find different uh, testimonials and writings of the disciples, what they went through. Most of them were killed. Uh, in fact, all of them were, were martyred, were killed in certain ways. Some of them were horribly. Uh, we know Peter was upside down, crucified. There's a couple of them actually that were crucified upside down. Um, this guy just wouldn't die. Uh, this guy, they tried very hard to kill him. Uh, John and his believer, uh, readers, uh, he, was, he was persecuted. He, uh, he knew that, uh, that Christ was the redeemed, but um, this, uh, this, this island called Patmos was located in the Asian Sea off the coast of Asia Minor. It's modern-day Turkey. And part of a group of about 50 islands. Patmos was a barren, rocky, crescent-shaped island in John's day that was about 10 miles long and less than 6 miles wide. At its widest point, it, it served as a Roman penal colony. According to early Christian historian Eusebius, the emperor Nerva released John from Patmos. So he was out there. They would put these guys out there to die, basically. 
Before they sent him to Patmos, which you can read in a lot of the history, history uh, writings, they try to boil John in, in boiling oil, and he didn't die. Um, I don't know if God just made the boiling cooled up. I don't know if he just was really good at hot stuff. Not sure. Uh, I don't know if he was swimming around like it was a hot tub. I'm not really sure. But there was a lot of different ways they tried to kill this guy. Okay? And he wouldn't die. So they sent him out. By the way, the, the, the history of it is that he actually didn't die out there either. They at one point brought him back. And he was so beat up though. His body was so beat up that they actually had to carry him from place to place. And they said his message as he went from place to place was love one another and love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. That's all he had. Because that's all he needed. <laughs> Could you imagine a guy like this coming to our church? <laughs> like, oh, you're the guy they try to kill, and you're the guy that wrote most of the New Testament, and you're still alive? I think we're going to listen, right? By the way, there was something important about him, too, in one of his, in his gospel that, uh, oh, yeah, he was the beloved, right? He never na in, this, in the gospel of John, he never said his name. What did he say? Disciple Jesus loved. Jesus, the disciple Jesus loved. That's a, I mean, that's a pretty awesome, awesome title, by the way. I'd take that one over any of them. <laughs> so, he's out in Patmos, uh, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, Write in a book what you see, and said it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. All right, so he's, he's told to write these things down. The question is on this one, what are some of the interpretive issues and some of the different, and not a huge big deal, but they say, what was the Lord's day? What do you guys think it means by the Lord's day? Sunday. Sabbath. Okay, so if it was the Sabbath, that would be Saturday. If it's the Lord's Day, would it be Sunday? Well, that's the question. Every day. Okay, but it, it, there was it, this was a specific day he's talking about, so the question is, what is this? Um, it appears many times in early Christian writings it refers to Sunday because the Lord's Day is the day that he rose from the dead. Okay? When he rose from the dead, we know that was on a Sunday. We know that happened. And by the way, that's there's a lot of, uh, again... Controversy on this, but that's why we worship on Sunday, not on Saturday, because it's the day that the Lord rose from the dead. Um, people say we do it on Sunday because of the Catholic Church, and the only reason we do it on Sunday is because the Catholic Church changed it. I would totally disagree with that, and I think historic, history actually disagrees with that. Okay, so, um, but it was the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a lot. That'd be a good church service, huh? I don't know about you, but. Uh, you're in our Lord's day, and all of a sudden you have a sound like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. There's an obviously message to him, and he gives, he gives these cities and, and these, these ideas uh, of who to send it to. Um, these, these cities, you can actually look them up. Obviously, we have a letter to uh, the Ephesian church. Um, you can see some of these cities. You can, you can look at what these people were going through. You can look at uh, some of the history of what these people were going through. A lot of persecution throughout these, throughout these churches. And a lot of them were falling because of the persecution. And we're going to see that as we get into the letters. And he says in verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest was a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like uh, white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters." In his right hand he held the seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Okay? What comes out in this? Description of the glorified Christ. Absolutely. Is this the only place this is talked about? No. No, you actually see this in Scripture. In the Old Testament even, you see these uh, these. Uh, explanations of Christ, um, 
And, and I would encourage you, if you want to do a kind of cool study, is to look them up and see in the context of the Old Testament and what, what, what it was talking about. Um, obviously, it's always talking about Christ. But again, if John lost his mind, why is he so specific on who Christ is and the fact that you see this, this explanation or this uh, description of him throughout the scriptures, right? Go ahead. Uh, I often wondered, how did he actually see it? Was it a vision right in the, that the angel was showing him? Or was he... Well, you look at, I mean, he's in the Spirit. Okay, it talks about that, right? Yeah. What does that mean to be in the Spirit? That is in, that is, uh, that is understanding that you're, you're in that, in a place with Christ, okay? In fact, he talks about later on that he actually is taken up. With that, that's not till chapter 4, I believe, where he says he's taken up, and that's when he starts seeing the future, okay? But the angel's telling him in this, so he is, um, he's telling him, and, and he's in the spirit, so God is at, at so he, he couldn't be in the flesh, because if he was in the flesh, what would happen to him? As Moses couldn't see the glory of God, he wouldn't be able to have a conversation with him, he couldn't be able to handle it. That's why he's still, though, what happens to him, <laughs> he, he drops, he, in fact, it says, um, if you keep going, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. So this is obviously Christ, because it says, I am the Alpha and Omega, I am the first and the last. This is Christ. So he is, he is overwhelmed by what he sees. He does drop, but he's not in heaven yet, but he's in the Spirit, so it's a different, it's a different realm. What is that? You know, we see that throughout Scripture. I, I don't know, I haven't yet been in that spot i i pray for it because i would like to know uh to be able to walk in the spirit in those times um but he tells us to walk in the spirit not in the flesh he's in a spiritual realm i don't know what it is though anybody else have any insight on that would that be similar to an out-of-body experience like could very well <clears throat> could very well be yeah I know, but he laid his right hand on me. Yep. So it's like, he's there. I just think it's uh, the, the Spirit, you know, when he says that I was in the Spirit, in fact, let's go back, it says, th this was, John says this was not a dream. Uh, John was supernaturally transported out of the material world awake, not sleeping, to an experience beyond the normal senses. The Holy Spirit empowered his senses to receive revelation from God. Again, what does that completely mean? We don't, we don't know. Now, somebody online could be like, "Oh, I know what that is." They they don't know what that is. They they really don't. I mean, you can look at the different understandings of scriptures, and you can see what the spirit world is. I believe that it's just a a state that is that is your physical, but it's different. I would say it's like when Jesus walked up. You know, he went up what to the to the uh, transfiguration, right? And, and he was there, he was there physically, but he changed spiritually. But they still recognized him, they knew who he was, right? So, I w is that more like what we're going to be like in heaven? Was he in his heaven state? I, I don't know, right? So, that's kind of the unknown, unless someone has any grand uh, revelation on that. All right, sweet. All right, so, understand that's a great question, though. Okay. So he turned, um, I love this part. This is the, let's look at some of the, uh, the description. Um, so starting off, what are the seven golden lampstands? Churches. Okay. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man. This is Jesus Christ. Okay, we are very clear on this because we see this, this description a couple times. He's clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest was a golden sash. What does that mean? Why is that important? Didn't the priests have a sash? Yeah, and they also had a robe that went all the way to the floor. Yes. It is, it is a representation of the high priest. The golden sash across his chest completes the picture of Christ serving 
this high priestly role. They wore this. This was literally what they would, what the high priest would wear. So again, he's, he's a representation of being the high priest. His head, now the, the high priest didn't have this next part. Okay, well, unless they were old, but I'm sure it wasn't this, you know. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. Okay, what does that mean? Purity. Purity. Yeah, ancient of days. It does not refer to a flat white color, but a blazing, glowing white light, the glory cloud. It is a picture of his holiness. It's his purity, his holiness. All right? So, his eyes were like a flame of fire. That doesn't sound like exciting. I mean, it sounds cool to see, but it's a little scary. What is that? Intense, like they're taking in everything, seeing through everything. Yes. It looks in the depths of the church, in the depths of your soul, really. It goes, it goes beyond the, the, the outer, right? It goes, it goes pure, purely in. And fire... What does fire do? It destroys, but it also cleanses. purifies and it cleanses. Yes. And I think so many times people look at fire like destruction, and that's not what this fire is. It's more cleansing. It's more purifying. That's what it talks about. The fire is a purifying power, right? And he wants to purify us like, like gold. That's pretty awesome. But also, you know, I could see where it's scary. Um, for me, it's exciting. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. What, what is that? Judgment. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, so this brass feet is clear reference, clear reference to that, you know, in the furnace, when it is there, it, it is being, it's being purified, it is being judged in a way, okay, because that, because it's not pure, that's why they, they heat up bronze and all the imperfections come out, right? And then they take that out. So it is. It's a judgment. It's a divine judgment. That's what these feet are. That's what this is a representation of. Okay? So then, um, when it has been made to glow into a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. I like this part. Why do you think, why is that so kind of cool? In the Psalms, it talks about the voice of the Lord, except his like many waters. Yes. You hear references of that. Well, let me ask you something. Have you guys ever been around Niagara Falls? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's power. It's power, but it's comforting as well, isn't it? Like you listen to it, and, and you know, you think about when you're around Niagara Falls and you're sitting there, and the mist comes. It's almost like, again, it's cleansing, isn't it? And it. And it, it, yes, it's powerful. Now, if you're floating down it, you're scared, right? <laughs> but if you're watching the power and you're seeing the purification and what it can do, it can give life as well, right? And that's the thing that's interesting. Go ahead, Mary. Uh, so all this is really relative to the churches. It sounds like the sanctification of the saints. It's, uh, in his in the description you're saying or yeah. in yeah i mean it is and that's what he is he is the purifier he is the one but if you look at it each part of who he is is redemption it's it is justification it is purification it is that that understanding of standing in the gap for us and that's what he started with right that he died for us and the, his blood set us free from our sin so we see that every part of christ and the descriptions of him throughout the word are that purification and that and that just every aspect of just holiness and that's where christ is in us to lead us to holiness guys that's the understanding you will be judged and and and, and guess what what are you going to be judged on our works okay our works based on what though What's that? Faith. Faith. Faith in Christ. It's our works based on what Christ has done in us and what Christ is doing through us. We're not going to be judged separately with our works. We're going to be judged because of Christ in us through the purification and the justification of Christ's blood. It's not Josh Shinoga is here by himself and we have to look at all of his works. No. 
It's because of Christ that I'm even doing what I'm doing and even being able to be purified and be justified. That's the understanding of it. And that, that's what this defini- these, uh, these descriptions are. I just love that, that sounding water, that, that symbol of what that is. I don't know. I just think that's really cool. So, his right hand are the seven stars. Okay. What are the seven stars? Yeah, it's the seven churches. It's in his hand. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in, the, in, it, in, it, in its strength. So this two-edged sword, we see this a couple of times in Scripture. What is that? Why is that? So his, his mouth. It's what? The Word of God. It is the Word of God. Very clearly. Aren't the seven stars different than the seven rams? So the seven star, well, it depends on who you're saying, but what we're seeing is it's the seven stars are a lot of times the same representation of they're the churches. The lampstands are the churches. The, what, the spirit, the seven spirits are something different. And some people will say that those are the pastors over the churches. I don't believe that. I think it's the Holy Spirit over the churches is what I, is what I think. Do you know something different? Not really. I just was, I always, I guess that when simple reading, I was thinking of the pastors or like the the, the leaders. Of the, the leaders church. of the churches. Yeah. There is some there's some interpretations of that, and there's others that kind of um, kind of go because really, what what you look at the lampstands, it's actually um, it's the it's the it's where they get the menorah from. Okay, mm-hmm. and that's that's kind of that same. Uh, understanding of it, right? But what those are is what are they? Are they're oil lamps? Each lamp represented a church from which the light of the life shone throughout the scriptures. Seven is the number of completeness. So it's like th- these seven churches are for some reason um, an understanding of the completeness. As you walk in these things, in it, like if really you wanted to be a a complete church, you would follow all the things that tells them that they're doing right and do those things. <laughs> And that would be only by the Spirit of God. So, but the only what I've seen before is the seven lampstands and seven stars are both representations of the churches. Um, the seven the stars world. are the angels. Yeah, the light in the world. Yep. What's that? Go ahead. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches in verse twenty. Okay. But it's a representation of the churches, and that's. That's what I was just trying to get to. Um, anything else on that? All right, so where were we? I got lost here. 17? Oh, yeah, 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which you are, and the things will take place after these things. And again, there's that interpretation of the whole book of Revelation. At, and he's writing right now, he's, he's writing uh, things which you have seen, right? And then because he's, he's experienced these things, he's experienced what Christ is, he knows the seven churches, he's, he's watched this happen in his life, all right? And then um, he keeps going. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you have saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angel and the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So it's like, what are those angels? Are they, are they angels? Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Greek word in the angels, as you guys know, means messenger. So some people will translate that as the pastors um, of the churches. Some will say it's, it's the spirit of God over these churches. I don't know if it matters one way or another, but... Yeah, we don't exactly know how God manages his angels. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, we don't. I've never seen it. I know there's there's levels, right. right? But we don't know exactly how. Does that make sense? Anybody else have anything on this? Well, if he sends his ministering angels, so they could also be guardians of the churches. 
It could be. Yep. Israel had an archangel watching over them. Yeah, there's definitely angels in our midst. There's we see that, right? Um, again, how it all completely works, we don't we don't have a complete definition or uh, understanding of it. At least I don't. If someone else does, Which it's cool. Means we don't need to know. Yeah, we just trust that they're and, and angels. By the way, just to make sure you understand, you have to see this clear. Some people will say that people that die, human beings die, they become angels. That is not what the Bible, it does not say that, okay? We are different, we are different um, created beings for some reason. Angels are God's messengers, angels are God's uh, servants just like we are, but for some reason, God has chose us to be on this planet and we are different than angels. We are saints, we are priests of God, and the angels are, are God's servants, basically. Yeah, we have free will and they don't. We have free will. Well, they did at one point. They had to have because a third of the stars went with Satan. And Satan was an angel, you know, and, and he had free will. So I don't know. that The free will of angels. It just happened at once. What's that? It happened once, you know. It was then. If you don't continue to see Yeah, it might be because you don't see after that. You're right. You see basically that choice at that one time. Does that mean that they never, ever have free will again? I not. It doesn't say yes or no, but I, you know, you don't see it. Okay. You see it at one time. Yeah. They made their choice and they're sticking with it. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, you even see the, 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 you know, the demons when Jesus has experiences with demons. They're, they're not. They know who Jesus is, but they're not serving Jesus. Well, they have to do what he says, <laughs> but they're not bowing to him, and uh, it's wild. I mean, I don't know. It's a very interesting thing and fun to study I guess but I don't know all of that so yeah Larry the, all the angels seem to be knowing of what's going on in these churches now is that to say that's taking place now too that the angels know what's going on yeah do we have angels in each church now? I know there's angels in our midst. I don't know if there's if there's angels, you know, I mean, I hope there's angels leading us. I know um, I, I've never talked to them, but uh, what's that, Lauren? Is there angels assigned to your church? Yeah, I, do, I don't know. Um, they better have a big one for ours. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, but yeah, I mean, I would assume that there are angels in our midst and that, that God is using them to uh, to help us. It talks about protecting us. It talks about that kind of stuff, but I don't know how that all works. I mean, where is that in the New Testament? Where it's like, and some have entertained angels unaware. Yes. So you would never know if you were entertaining an angel or not. Right, that's why we need to walk in Christ and be spirit-filled and not fleshly, right? And... And an angel will always do one thing. They will lead you to a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ. Anything of God will always bring you to the Father, always bring you to Christ, always bring you to Him and not away from Him. I just actually talked to someone recently that was like, well, I, I feel like I should, you know, do this one thing, and it might be sin. What do you think? Um, I'm going to throw it out there, but no. Okay. God will never lead you to sin. He will never lead you to go against what he tells you in his word that is righteousness. He will never lead you to unrighteousness. Love will always lead you to righteousness. Right? It will always draw you to the Lord, not push you away. That's right. Yep. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> one of the things that, really quick, I wanted to read this because of what Tom brought up. Uh, uh, it says, uh, John MacArthur says this, the word literally means messenger, although it can mean angel that, and does throughout the book. It cannot refer to angels here because angels are never leaders in the church. Most likely, these messengers are the seven key elders representing each of the, those churches. So, I don't, I don't know. I mean, we do see that word messenger many times in the scriptures. Um, a couple of different commentaries kind of get. I don't completely agree with John on this. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if you look at the original word for angel. It, 
it basically you see it throughout the scriptures. You don't see a lot of different. It's messenger basically. So I don't know how that all works, but. Usually we do see that throughout scriptures they are messengers. I do want. I want to encourage you on one thing as we're going to continue through this. <clears throat> what this should do. My goal. I'm gonna. I'm studying it. And I'm bringing stuff to you. But the goal isn't for you to come here and get answers from Josh Sonoga. What do you think the goal is? For you to go and study yourself. Don't even, even if you, I say something that's interesting, it's probably not for me. If you hear something that's like, wow, don't believe me. Go study. Guys, Bible studies are not meant for you to just go and listen. And be stagnant. They're for you to be encouraged to go, I want to see more of this. And I want to read more of it. And I want to understand it myself. It's for you to go and to study yourself. So anything you're going to ask of me or anybody else, it should spur you on to go after what the Word of God and the truth of the Word of God is. That's what it should do. The things that I'm giving you, those are just references. They're, they're from people too. John MacArthur's an awesome Awesome teacher, but he's a dude, right? And God's taught him a lot of stuff. But John MacArthur would say the same thing. Don't believe me. Go study to show yourself approved. Go look at the Word of God. Because, guys, I'm going to tell you that God's Word is the only thing that's going to transform you, not me, not my words. I hope it's not my words. <laughs> it's only God's words that are going to transform you. So as we go on to this, guess you guys know where we're going to be next week. You know why you know this? Because we just finished chapter 1, and after chapter 1 is chapter 2, okay? So do me a favor, then after that's chapter 3. I know it's crazy, it's a lot of math, but um, I'm encouraging you, read chapter 2. Study it, come prepared, because I love hearing from you guys. This is what I, that's why I do what I do. I want to hear from your hearts, and I want to hear what God has. And I hope that this is an encouragement to you, all right? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. I thank you for your word and truth. And I do pray, Lord, that, that there are angels in our midst, Lord, that we can be guided by, that we can hear your truth by. And as we go through Revelation, Lord, that you would teach us. Teach us what it is that you desire of us. Lord, not that we are to be fearful because we know you're in control. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to lead each other, Lord. And I pray that you'll help me to lead, lead this group to dive into what your word is. And Lord, um, help us not even come close to walking away from the truth of what it is. Help us not get into arguments or be distracted because what it's about is you and who you are and your redemptive purpose of our lives. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you that you've given us everlasting life. We pray that you'd be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you so much.